So I have with me a special show. I have with me Bill Kramer of NCSA and the Blue, Blue Waters Project and John Dizzy Barth, also of Blue Waters and the Krill Institute. Uh, it's actually a different setup. We're actually in the same room for one. So if you guys could please introduce yourselves and give a little bit of background. Uh, I'm John Z. Barth. I'm with the Krell Institute, and I work uh, help the uh, Blue Waters Project, uh, especially with respect to uh, the Great Lakes Consortium for Petascale Computing, which are the 28 uh, universities and other educational institutions that uh, came together to support the proposal that went to the National Science Foundation for the Blue Water System. I'm Bill Kramer. I'm the Deputy Project Director for Blue Waters, uh, which means that I uh, take care of the day-to-day -day issues of uh, the project. We're right now in the deployment phase of, of uh, uh, crafting the system and, and getting it delivered and, and uh, uh, deployed and going through uh, uh, additional activities to do software development for it and, and uh, some value-added activities. Uh, and then we'll go into a five-year period where we operate the system for uh, science and engineering applications uh, at uh, scale. Okay, so can you get a quick summary of exactly what Blue Waters is? What is its goals? And so uh, Blue Waters is used in two, uh, two terms. One is a, a computer system that uh, is uh, the leading system of its generation for open science. It'll be the largest system and the first uh, sustained uh, performance above a petaflop for a wide range of applications, all the science applications. Uh, the other uh, part of Blue Waters is a large project that not only is about the, taking a system and putting it in place, but all the, uh, the ecosystem, if you will, uh, the infrastructure that goes around that system, including uh, all the support that goes around that system. And one of the main focuses that makes this project a little bit different is we're doing a lot of very early work uh, even before the technology is, is uh, available to help applications prepare for running at scales that uh, uh, Blue Waters will be um, able to run at and doing transformative science problems. So we're actually engaged with its 18 uh, science teams right now that will uh, increase over the next year or two. But we're, we're working with them on, on their single CPU performance, we're working with them on uh, how they uh, their code scale, re-engineering things, working on I.O. Uh, uh, bottlenecks, other types of bottlenecks, and also improved methodologies in terms of uh, the programming environment, the tools that they use to uh, uh, work to understand uh, their, their applications, modeling of their applications uh, in, in a, a more formal manner, and a variety of other support activities. So that when the machine comes into existence at full scale, uh, all these science teams are able to start running their real science rather than spending six months or a year tweaking and tuning and trying to figure out what to do. So we're actually doing that upfront work uh, now through via stimulation <coughs> and modeling and, and other things and eventually access to, to uh, hardware uh, in order to get uh, this, helping the science teams get ready for such a, a, a novel system. So actually we had a question <laughs> off of Twitter that um, requested how many people do you actually expect to will be able to take advantage? Will it just be these 16 teams that will be able to actually take advantage of a petaflop type system at day one? And then how many do you expect at six months, 12 months? What's kind of the ramp up in resources available? So uh, we think that there are many uh, areas of science that can use the capability of, of a sustained petaflop. And, and to us, that means really time to solution. So, while you have to measure this some way that people can understand, uh, it really is taking the applications that people need to use or applications of, of the future a couple years in advance, science, or, or challenging problems, putting them together and then wanting to solve that problem in a certain amount of time. Uh, <coughs> and there's two ways to look at this. One is who can use the entire system at a, a rate uh, that uh, translates into a sustained petaflop and that's actually some of the benchmarks. The other thing is the, the, uh, what I call the sustained system performance. So if you think about a range of applications and uh, their performance on their, their problem and, and their application, regardless of does it use the whole system or a quarter of the system or, or uh, a tenth of the system, uh, and you look at across all those things that are going to be running simultaneously, the system still will perform above a petaflop across that. 
and uh, that's the other way that, that we measure this. So uh, it's not just a couple of big things. It's taking a uh, system that is uh, targeted to be uh, probably the most productive system uh, in coming out of the DARPA program, the, the, the HPCS program, uh, the most productive system for people to use and helping them make very effective use of that regardless of the scale of the system. Now we expect that uh, in uh, initial uh, operation there will be about uh, 30 to 40 science teams that are allocated the vast majority of the time on the system. Those teams will almost certainly uh, have multiple uh, uh, parties on it, but they're all trying to solve one uh, science problem uh, in, in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, they may use multiple codes. As a matter of fact, most of them right now are double. We, we, know, we know at the moment there's been about 18 teams identified. Uh, there's going to be another call for there is another call for proposals out that'll double that number. And then we have some other teams as well. Uh, the, the GLCPC has an allocation process in addition to this for some additional teams, but in general, the, uh, the criteria is that uh, people are proposing to do something at, at a scale well above what they can get in their normal resource uh, allocations, be that on track twos or be that at the university computing areas. So we expect that there's a large number of, of science problems that need this type of uh, resource. And the other thing is it's a very balanced resource, so it's not just uh, uh, raw flops, but it's, it's memory bandwidth, it's, it's low latency communication, all of which are unique features of this machine. So what is actually the uh, allocation process? You said there was a call for participation. The Great Lakes um, region has its own access for this. What exactly are you looking for when someone submits a proposal for time on Blue Waters? So uh, uh, the Blue Waters project in NCSA does not, uh, is, is not uh, the arbiter of who gets on the system. The vast majority of the time, at least 80% of the time, will be uh, allocated through a new process that the National Science Foundation has set up called the PRAC process, Petascale res uh, Resource Allocation, or Petascale uh, Computing Resource Allocation, the, the, the letters they got switched to have a, a sayable acronym. The, uh, that process will allocate 80% of the time, and, and that's where we're expecting this 30 to 40 teams to, to come from. Uh, there are a few other uh, uh, allocations for smaller percents. One is the Great Lakes uh, Consortium that John can speak about. We have another one for education, general education, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, probably some adjustment uh, in, in a sm small amount of discretionary time that we could do for startup projects. So there are multiple ways to start, um, but the, the, the large allocations are, are going to come from the National Science Foundation. Do you, you want to add to that? Yeah, the GLCPC charter members, uh, of which University of uh, Michigan is one, uh, they have an allocation and uh, there will be a process so that uh, uh, teams of scientists at uh, those universities can submit uh, problems to go on to this system and hopefully then scale those up so that they fit under the PRAC uh, allocation process in the future. So it, they're, they're, in a sense, they're startup accounts, but they're really startup accounts of of real science that has the potential of scaling. So, mm -hmm. so what can a, uh, like I'm a sysadmin at the University of Michigan who's a member of um, this consortium as well as, you know, highly involved in NSF, um, being a local resource provider, but don't, I don't care if people use my local resource, I just want to enable science at my institution. What can I do as an admin to enable people to access either Blue Waters resource or some other resource? Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, they're, they're probably uh, looking to help people uh, work uh, to scale their problems to some, some degree, right? So, so having such a large resource, uh, uh, the goal is that it's used for things that can't be done in local environments, whatever. So uh, I think helping people get to uh, a point where they have the experience that they can say, okay, I, I have a method to get to the next level of, of uh, uh, science uh, using uh, computational techniques is an important thing. I think having well understood uh, uh, codes that they, they would be using, uh, maybe with uh, some 
a model or understanding about where the performance bottlenecks could be, and then we can use our simulation environment or eventually real hardware to understand uh, can uh, a system like Blue Waters alleviate some of those either because it has raw performance or because we're able to re-engineer some of the, the methodologies in the code and help people do that uh, is, an, is another way. Uh, I.O. is an area that, that I think uh, is challenging as uh, codes uh, scale and has actually been identified as an area many of these, these science teams are going to be working with to improve the performance of, of their, their code or, or the, uh, reduce the time of solution or the problem that they're, they're specifying. Uh, also being uh, out of the box, our system will uh, encourage people to use uh, new programming methodologies and, and, and advanced libraries, things like UPC and Co-Ray Fortran. There's actually hardware support for those. Uh, now we don't expect people to rewrite their codes entirely, but we do think that since it's a multi-core chip, right? So it's eight cores per processor and, and, and four of those processors joined together into uh, what you'd call a node. Uh, the, uh, the use of, of uh, other programming models for maybe subroutines or library routines uh, might be beneficial and it offers a, a different uh, version maybe that will scale up because there's actually hardware support for that. There's hardware support for collectives in the, in the interconnect that will help things like all reduce and, and various synchronization. Uh, so um, uh, helping people get to, to a point where they're capable of going to the next step uh, in terms of, of what their science problem is that they're trying to solve as well as uh, the, the method that they use uh, would be, I think, very useful. Uh, we do have some collaborations. I mentioned the project is uh, involved very much with uh, adding value above just deploy this big system, right? Mm -hmm. The whole idea is the big system. Uh, we want people to find it uh, useful and that they're effective in using it. So we have about 10 or 12 collaborations right now that uh, uh, involve the programming environment but also involve system software. Uh, and they range from uh, new ways of, of managing the uh, I.O. on the system, uh, from the system side. Uh, transparent movement of I.O. from online storage to airline storage and back information lifecycle management, uh, parallelization, uh, uh, parallel tape um, uh, for performance as well as reliability, a variety of different things that we're doing in the I.O. structure of the system that, that will be novel. Helping uh, do that and, and being involved in those collaborations, uh, they're, they're open and most uh, don't require uh, proprietary information to be exchanged between uh, the collaboration and IBM. We have another uh, couple things focused very much on workflow, uh, Eclipse tools for how you debug at scale and, and performance scale. So uh, involvement in those collaborations, uh, we're open to having uh, more people help with those. Much of those collaborations are meant to not just apply to, to the system that we call Blue Waters, but other systems uh, throughout the community. Uh, we've already published some uh, specifications for APIs or, or, or uh, drafts for uh, ways of doing things that we'd like the community to be involved with. We've presented tutorials, we've presented um, uh, things in supercomputing. So the involvement in our collaboration areas would be a great thing to do. So back on the allocation thing, um, given that Blue Waters and TerraGrid are both funded by NSF, what was really the reason of having a separate allocation instead of integrating this in with the TerraGrid national resource? So I can't speak definitively for NSF, but mm -hmm. um, I think that they recognize that uh, they wanted to uh, uh, use a system like this for the unique problems that, that uh, can't be done elsewhere. Uh, the other reason is that uh, within the federal government, there are a few systems that uh, are called leadership systems or track one systems. And uh, there, when that whole activity was funded uh, jointly through uh, uh, government initiatives, uh, it was determined that, that those systems could not just be used within a single agency, that they had to be national resources. So for the first time, there is no restriction on who can use this NSF resource. It doesn't matter how their funding gets there, what organization they come from, uh, anybody can apply to use this, uh, uh, this resource for science or engineering that, that is uh, transformed or could be even other disciplines than that. So that's another motivation that, that the uh, other allocation processes were for 
NSF uh, related projects. Um, and this is a completely open resource because it's a national resource as opposed to an NSF resource. And that needed to have a distinction between those two. Uh, DOE has done the same thing with their leadership facilities. The program that they use to allocate called Insight is a completely open uh, allocation process uh, and anybody can apply for that and indeed they, they've made awards in that. So I think that that's a big motivation as well. Okay, so I have two final things because we're running short on time here. Um, what is the expected lifetime of the Blue Waters project in its current inception, including the system, the support base that's being put up for these petascale applications? And then finally, what is there any plan for what's coming after Blue Waters? What's kind of, you know, what do you have in mind? What would you like to see happen or what is actually like in the process of happening? Uh, so uh, the system, uh, the schedule is that we all have Blue Waters fully in, in full, what I call full service uh, by next summer summer of 2011. Uh, we already uh, have access to some uh, early uh, equipment um, uh, and that will start to build up the system starting the, towards the end of this year. Uh, and we'll actually in Illinois also be deploying the, the DARPA prototype which is about a third of the size of Blue Waters eventually. Uh, so uh, we start doing that this summer working through the next summer to get everything working properly and, and, and through there. Uh, we have five years of, of uh, operation and, and support uh, after full deployment. So from the mid-2011 to mid-2016 will be the time period where the system has its impact and, and people can use it and solve science problems. Uh, we're hoping that that impact will, will be significant early on. That's why we're investing so much energy uh, with the science teams to, to work early on. Uh, what goes on after Blue Water is actually uh, uh, we, we have ideas and thoughts. Um, a lot will depend upon uh, a couple things. One is um, uh, the uh, whatever programs the National Science Foundation or other government organizations uh, uh, institute to continue uh, computational infrastructure. There's a lot of activity within the National Science Foundation about how and what they will do uh, as their, their next generation of, of uh, uh, computational infrastructure going on right now. Uh, I think that Blue Waters actually will be a very interesting uh, uh, experimental uh, resource uh, in the sense that many of the problems that we'll see some of in Blue Waters, multi-core, uh, larger scale, uh, while Blue Waters is set up to be easy to use and easier to use in a lot of uh, commodity architectures or other architectures. So for example we have about 300,000 cores. Uh, similar systems uh, uh, would have uh, around a million cores or a million and a half cores. So, so Blue Waters will be easier to use to some degree, but still challenging. But I think that we can observe many of those issues that will uh, be challenging to us in the next generation, be that exascale or multiple hundreds of petascale. Reliability, resiliency, um, uh, continued scaling, uh, optimization, tools, how do you debug it, you know, hundreds of thousands of cores. So we can use the experiences of Blue Waters to, to inform what we do next, both on the research for new systems and the development of new systems. And um, I think that that's an important aspect that we'll have. Our, our I.O. infrastructure, uh, we're planning to be quite aggressive, but, you know, uh, hopefully uh, they'll, we'll succeed, but at the very least, the lessons that we learn in trying to do that uh, will inform other ways of, of uh, implementing the similar services. Okay, and uh, is there anything else you guys would like to make sure gets mentioned and gets out there? What's that? Well, so so uh, I think uh, if people uh, are interested, they should uh, contact us. We have our website at, at NCSA, and uh, either to participate in the collaboration work or to actually apply uh, for science projects through. Uh, uh, NSF or, or GLCPC or other mechanisms and hopefully uh, you'll be hearing more about us as the system actually comes into existence and uh, uh, it will end up with uh, a lot of impact on open science because it's completely open to everybody. Okay, thank you very much Bill and John. Thank you. Thank you.